In this Elden Ring video, I'm going to be showing you my Magus build, which is an evolution of the Spellblade and sort of the next step in the way that you play this build. Just a heads up before you watch too far into this video, I will be showing the Lurnia of the Lakes area of the game as well as Siafra River, which is the first underground area. So if you do not want spoilers for those areas of the game, do not watch any further. As I mentioned in my previous video, the Enchanted Knight build, the way you play a Magic Melee character sort of splits. You either lean into the Carrion Sword sorceries, or you go into a different direction where you use like a magic-based weapon and some magic spells. The Magus build is a combination of magic and a magic-based weapon instead of leaning into the Carrion Sword sorceries. I've noticed quite a few people talking about using the Moonveil Katana. I actually have a build planned for this. If you remember during Demon Souls, I made a build called the Soul Samurai. I'm planning on making a similar build using the Moonveil Katana for that, so you can stay tuned for that build soon. The staff you want for this build is probably going to be the Meteorite Staff. You can use the Academy Glintstone Staff once you meet the requirements of 28 Intelligence. However, you're going to have to upgrade it a ways before it surpasses the Meteorite Staff, so I recommend using the Meteorite Staff at this point in the game, but getting that staff and upgrading it when you can. It's located in Rhea Lucaria, and the exact location is located on the wiki. The next thing you'll need for this build is a Rapier. The reason you specifically want a Rapier and not Roger's Rapier or an Estoc or some other weapon like the EP is because the Rapier has 130 critical, meaning that anytime you do a critical attack, you're going to deal more damage than you would do if you used Roger's Rapier or an Estoc because those have lower critical ratings. So anytime you stagger an enemy and stab them, or you backstab them, or you get a parry, and then you do a critical attack, you're going to do far more damage, so you want a Rapier specifically for this build. You can purchase one in Round Table Hold for a thousand runes. If you're hurting for upgrade materials, there is a tunnel, Rhea Lucaria Tunnel, on the eastern side of Learning of the Lakes that has a bell that you can turn into the Twin Maiden Husks that will allow you to get Smithing Stones 1 and 2 from her for a rune, so you can farm runes and just buy them, which is a lot faster. And if you need Smithing Stones 3, you can actually farm the Knights outside the southern entrance of Rhea Lucaria. This is a good place to farm them. The uh, the big wheelie thing that spits fire also drops Smithing Stone 3s there, so make sure you kill it while you're doing your runs through there. Beyond that, the three talismans you want for this build are Radigan Icon, Assassin Cerulean Dagger, and Graven School Talisman. Radigan Icon allows you to cast spells faster. This means that when you're buffing your weapon, it's going to be faster. It means when you use Carrion Greatsword, it's going to be faster, and Glintstone Pebble, it's going to be faster. This is kind of optional out of the three. You don't necessarily need this, but I do find it speeds up carry and greatsword a lot. And there are scenarios where you just won't be able to get it off if you don't use this icon. So consider swapping that one out if you want something else. But the other two are pretty much staples. Assassin Cerulean Dagger is really, really good for this build because you do a lot of backstabs. You do a lot of parries. And also you get a lot of staggers with this build. A lot of staggers... And this allows you to regain FP. In my testing, it gives 15 FP per critical attack, which is fantastic. It could be percentage-based because I happen to have exactly 100 FP during my testing. So it could be 15% of your total FP. I'm not exactly sure which. But it gives you a significant amount of FP back. And you want to aim to do critical attacks and backstabs in order to regain FP using this build. And the Graven School Talisman obviously upgrades your sorcery damage. This is just good for carrying greatsword in general. It's good for buffing your weapon with strength and armaments. So it'll increase the damage with that and glintstone pebble, all three of those things. When it comes to helmets, I like to use the Queen's Crescent Crown to increase my intelligence, but there are a fair number of other intelligence helmets you can use. Just getting that extra damage on your sorceries is always good. And then as far as armor, it doesn't really matter what armor you use. As long as you use uh, armors that, you know, the heaviest you can use in still medium roll is ideal. But the spell blade set, the gloves of it that you get from Roger eventually actually increase Glintstone sorcery damage. So you're going to want to be on the lookout for those when you can get them. The spells that you want for this build are Carrion Greatsword, Scholar's Armaments, and Glintstone Pebble. You're obviously, you can add to this if you want to use other magic as well. A good choice is Loretta's Great Bow, just for some extra range if you need it. But if you're playing as a Magus, you probably want to get into melee range. But nevertheless, there are scenarios where range is useful, and you may find yourself using that spell. Carrion Greatsword gives you an absolute solution to large groups of enemies at once, uh, or horseback combat besides using Glintstone Pebble. 
The weakness of this build without carrying Greatsword is that it can't deal with multiple enemies effectively. The build shines very well on one-on-one -on -one scenarios like boss fights, but struggles with multiple enemies without carrying Greatsword. So you absolutely want to make sure you use this and use it when you are surrounded by multiple enemies. Scholar's Armaments is used to buff your right hand weapon and it lasts about two or three minutes. I haven't timed it exactly, but it deals substantial damage. It over doubles your damage with your right hand attack and it scales off your staff upgrades and it scales off your intelligence. So the higher these stats, the more it's gonna boost that. And what's great is the more you boost dexterity, the more you boost the natural damage of the weapon itself. So boosting dexterity boosts weapon damage here and boosting intelligence when you're using that also boosts weapon damage. Just a note about Scholar's Armaments also is that you cannot buff weapons with it that already have like two damage types. For instance, the Moonveil Katana is both physical and magic damage, so it cannot be buffed with this spell. It's one of the reasons we don't use it in this build. It's not the only reason, but you cannot buff weapons that basically have two different damage types on them, or maybe they you used an Ash of War in one and changed it to be scaling with magic or something. You won't be able to buff it, so you cannot do that with this build. And this brings me to my next point, which is actually the Ash of War that we're going to be using on the Rapier, which is Glint Blade Phalanx. And you might be asking, wait a second, you just said that we can't use Magic Scaling Ashes of War on a, a weapon. Otherwise, we can't buff it with Scholar's Armaments. But the thing is, you can actually put Glint Blade Phalanx on your Rapier and still maintain physical damage only, which is actually outstanding. And in this case, we use the Keen Scaling because we're going to be pumping Dexterity for this build. So you can still maintain the physical damage, get that Ash of War ability, which is fantastic, and still be able to buff it with Scholar's Armaments. So let's talk about Glint Blade Phalanx. We don't actually use Glint Blade Phalanx, the spell in this build. We use the Ash of War, and there are a couple reasons for that. First, the spell itself actually costs double the FP of the skill, and the damage is comparable, if not just a little bit less on the skill, depending on what your upgrade is. The higher you upgrade it, the more damage it's going to do. So it may actually catch up and outperform the spell at some point, depending on how it scales all the way up. I have not checked and seen all the way up to plus 25. But assuming you're at plus 10, your damage is going to do roughly the same as the spell, and it'll cost half as much. But wait, there's more. Glintblade Phalanx, the spell, doesn't really stagger enemies at all. But however, the skill does, and that is one of the reasons we use it with this build, and that is one of the primary reasons we use a rapier because you will constantly stagger enemies with Glenblade Phalanx, the Ash of War, which leaves them open to a critical strike, which you punish with your Rapier, and then regain the cost of the spell back with the Assassin Cerulean Talisman in order to regain that FP. This allows you to just spam this ability and regain FP constantly at, and stagger enemies and get free openings for huge damage, which, again, will seriously outperform the spell because it doesn't stagger them, and even if the spell does more damage by itself, that stagger and opening for a critical attack does far more damage than the spell will. Also, something I want to mention about Glimp Lane Phalanx, the Ash of War on your weapon that you might not know, is that immediately after you cast it with L2, if you press R2, you do like a lunging thrust, kind of similar to the impaling thrust that a uh, thrusting sword would have by default, which is really good for when you're casting this ability up close to an enemy. Like if you don't have a lot of breathing room, you know they're going to be attacking you immediately afterward. You press R2, slide into them, interrupt them, hit them with the blades again, maybe stagger them again, attack them, or almost stagger them, and then roll away. If you didn't know, there is a stagger bar on enemies in Elden Ring, not unlike yourself, that fills up the more you hit enemies. And when it's completely full, they kind of drop to a knee usually, and you can do a critical attack by running up to them and pressing R1, which is what you're going for with this build. Usually it's two casts of Glint Blade Phalanx, the Ash of War. Usually eight of those daggers hitting something or swords hitting something will cause them to stagger and you'll get a critical opportunity. You should mind that. Sometimes it's four with weaker enemies, but it's generally eight and very, very tough enemies. It might be 12, but you'll kind of get the hang of this. And if you miss a shot or one of the arrows misses or the swords misses, then you won't get exactly that many. And sometimes if you wait too long in between hits, you also won't get that stagger because just like you know i mentioned in another video that stagger meter or whatever that's filling up will start depleting you know if you don't hit them again right away so if you wait too long in between glimplate phalanxes you'll have to cast it a third time before you can stagger them or a fourth time in some cases the reason i mention this is because you want to be able to predict the staggers so that you're not rolling away and you miss out on the critical strike so 
learn how many shots it takes to stagger each enemy from just playing the game, and then you'll learn to be able to anticipate how many you need before you can, you know, go and get a critical attack on enemies. The playstyle of the Magus is a bit more advanced than the Enchanted Knight, in my opinion, because it you focus on parrying, for instance. You can use parries to get critical attacks to restore FP, and they deal crazy damage because of the buffed rapier, which is fantastic, but it's not something necessarily a new player would use. And without a proper shield to block with, it can be more difficult to play a melee character, um, and you're going to be a little bit more squishy, probably, because you're not going to have a lot of points into Endurance to wear heavier armor, so you're going to take more damage on average, so you have to be really good with your rolling. However, the Glint Blade Phalanx is kind of easy mode. If you learn to use this ability properly, you will easy mode bosses in a lot of cases. Talking about stat spread for a second, it's a little bit different than the Enchanted Knight in that you don't need really endurance at all. Like, your endurance isn't really much of a factor with this build. The armor that you're wearing isn't doesn't need to be heavy or anything like that. You're not planning on getting hit. And you want to spend most of your points in dexterity and intelligence and get away with as little vigor as you can. So, you, like, once your vigor is at 20, hopefully you have around 30 intelligence and you have around 20 dexterity. Something like that is going to be your go-to. And then you're just going to keep increasing intelligence and dexterity with, you know, bringing vigor up a little bit as well. That way you have maximum damage on your rapier, and when you get those criticals, they just hit for like, like a truck. So that pretty much wraps up our Magus build. Moving along to my next build, I'll probably do some sort of iteration of a level 50 Paladin. A lot of people have been clamoring for that. Uh, and then I'll probably get to the Soul Samurai build, which is a magic version of the Samurai that people have been asking for. I did something like this in Demon Souls. If you want to check that out, you can kind of get a general concept of how it'll play but I will get around to those as quick as I can and get them out to you guys.